I read from James 2, read, read a lengthy portion from 14 to 26 this morning. I want to talk about, uh, of course, the question is, what type of faith have you? I want to talk about the interpretation of faith, the identification of faith, and the illustration of faith after we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings you bestowed upon us. Even though things around us seem to be going at breakneck speed and panic setting in, we're comfortable knowing that you're in control. We know that you'll provide each and every day for us. And that if the worst thing ever happens to us, does happen, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So Father, we place our faith in you. And we want to walk in faith. We want to live in faith. We want to demonstrate our faith in every aspect of our life. So Father, I pray that you're working in every heart. Help us to have open and receptive ears this morning, Lord. Your word is really going to be penetrating, as it always is. And I pray that this message will be taken and used in every life here. So, Father, be with us. Make that difference in our life this morning. Because our Savior lives. He is a living God. He went to the cross and died for us. But he didn't stay in that tomb. He lives. And because he lives, we can live. And Father, that's the name that we pray in this morning. The wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, this portion of Scripture is really telling the Christian something important. God tests our faith, our faith, by our good works. Now, don't misunderstand me. James is not talking about doing good works in an attempt to earn salvation but faith that does produce good works. Many people have misinterpreted James badly. Martin Luther did. Some of the, the leaders of the faith, oh, he's talking about working for your, your saving your salvation. No, he's not. Many people have looked at this portion of Scripture and said, he's in contradiction with Paul. No, that's not true. You know, Paul made it abundantly clear, rightfully so, that salvation is by faith alone. Over in Galatians 2.16, he says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of, by the, the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. <clears throat> so the first thing we need to do this morning is Understand the interpretation of faith. What is faith? Well, I want to talk about the relationship of what Paul is speaking of and what, of course, James is speaking of here. But we have to come to an understanding of this definition as it's used by both of these men in the context of their writing. And when we do that, we're going to see that Paul and James are in perfect agreement. There's no contradiction whatsoever. James and Paul are discussing this from two different viewpoints. You know, Paul makes it abundantly clear that a person is not saved by works or deeds of the law, Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. In that wonderful letter to Galatians, Paul again states the same thing, that a person is not justified by works, but by faith in Christ. So the question is, how do we reconcile what Paul says and what James says on this matter? Well, Paul and James are not standing face to face, nose to nose, and toes to toe, arguing about these things. They're actually standing back to back and defending this position. What they're doing is, there's opposite foes. The attacks are coming from two different directions. And so that's why when we look at it at first glance, we think, well, he's saying something different, but he's not. These men are, are facing attacks from two different directions. In the early church, well, actually still today, but in that early church, Judaizers were demanding that a man first perform the works of the law, and they had to come by the law in order to be saved. That was one of the first heresies in the church. And of course, Paul fought against that hard. He answered them powerfully by explaining that the works of the law will not save you. 
And only faith in Christ can do that. The law only shows us that we're sinners. That we can't live to His standard. I'll tell you, and we can't even keep the Ten Commandments. We're only given nine of them in the New Testament. We can't keep those either. So this is important that we see and understand that both Paul and James are defending the fortress of faith. If we're to fully comprehend this, we need to understand the use of their terminology. All right? Well, Paul says that saving faith, a faith which is genuine, a faith which is real, transforms a person's life. That's a change. When you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, there's a change in your life. He says over Philippians 3, 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Now see, prior to Paul's conversion, he was a proud man. And he thought that doing these works oh, were just wonderful and glorious and going to lead him to God. And that's, But listen to what he says earlier over Philippians 3. He says he was circumcised on the eighth day, keeping the law. Of the stock of Israel, he was proud of that. Of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as of touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is the law, blameless. In other words, he said, I worked myself for the law, and I was just so good. I was a wonderful person working and working and working. But then again, when he found out about Jesus Christ, and when he came to salvation, he realized without faith, all those works were nothing. That's what he says. What things were gained to me, those things I count for loss. Those things that were so important to him when he was traveling up that road to Damascus became nothing once he came to Jesus Christ. Then his eyes were opened. There was a dramatic change in Paul's life. Amen. It was such a change that people were still afraid of him for a long time. He said, maybe he's just an undercover agent. But there was such a change. You talk about from black to white. There it was. In 1 Corinthians, that wonderful chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. In other words, he's saying, unless your faith was empty faith. Profession without belief. It's what I call plain church. You hear the words, you, you like the words, and you profess to believe. But it's not there. It's simply a profession. And there are so many people today playing church. I want to tell you that on a normal Sunday, today's not a normal Sunday. Churches are closed. I hear that. Several more are closed. But if this were a normal Sunday, Sunday, and the churches had their normal crowds. You know, there's some churches that if the rapture happened, the service would go on and nobody be disrupted. Professing Christians. Empty faith. See, the, the profession was not genuine. It can be, it, it can be seen as this because there's no change in the life. Well, I profess Christ, but you're living the same way. They continue in the same wickedness, the sinful lifestyle that they had lived previously, no change. And if there's no change, something is wrong. Here's the two questions that he asked in verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? It's a rhetorical question. There. Works will not, faith will. James is not talking about, by the way, the works of the law here, when he talks about have works. There's two different things that Paul talks about in James. James says that the faith, when he's talking about, produces works, good works, works of faith. When Paul talks about it, he's talking about works of law. Because he's fighting from a different point of view. He's fighting the Judaizers who say, you need to do the law. James says, if you're a true believer, you will work for the cause of Christ. He's, you know, back in that professing faith, if you just have professing faith, it's phony, it's counterfeit. It's not truly from a believing heart. 
as I always said, you might have head knowledge, but it hasn't transferred to the heart. It's not real to you. You know, so many people profess to be believers, and Jesus is not real to them. He lives, but he's not real to them. He is a name on a page, a story in a book. They know the stories. They might know the book, but it hasn't made it into their hearts yet. It's profession. You know, Paul said it refers to the same thing as this over in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 2. Unless ye have believed in vain. He's talking about that too. Just saying the words professing. Paul also said over in 2 Corinthians, this is important. Examine yourself, whether ye be in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. We talked a few weeks ago about looking in the mirror. Am I really saved? You know, a lot of times young people are saved or they think they're saved. Sometimes a teenager, some, sometimes an older person, and then one day the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them and they realize, I've never been saved. I've been sitting in a pew all these years and I've never really understood. That's why every now and then you'll see an older person come forward and say, you know, I made a profession when I was eight, nine years old. And now I'm 56 and I need to be saved. Because that profession, when you look in that mirror, and the Bible is a mirror, you understand. And there's a great hazard for preachers. You know, we want to, we have a desire to see people saved. And I hope you do too. But sometimes we accept an insincere answer. Yes, I'll trust Jesus. But you see, we live in a world today where it's so easy to be as phony as a $3 bill. We need to talk with people. We need to understand. You know, I'll sit down. I'm going to sit down and talk with people. Somebody wants to say, I want to be saved or I want to be baptized. We're going to sit down and talk. We need to un understand things. You need to explain to me what you believe. How do you feel? I want to know. We can't make a mistake. Because if we do that, as a preacher or anybody else, if I just casually take that yes, and I go on and I take them and I say oh, hallelujah and baptize them, you see, you're selling them a bill of goods and they begin to believe in their own heart that they're saved and they may not be. That's why we have to be careful. There's an old story that I heard years ago about the devil. And he's meeting with his demons and they're trying to best come up with a way to tell the people that God does not exist. Need to persuade men of that. You know, this is difficult because what do we read here in James? Even the devils believe in tremble. They know God's real. There was a time when they were in heaven with him. They know he's real. So how do they tell people this? One demon stood up and said, well, we'll just tell people that Jesus Christ never really existed. That men shouldn't believe such a far-fetched story. We'll just present it as a fairy tale. Another gene, demon stood up and said, we'll simply persuade men that death ends it all. When you're dead, you're dead. Don't worry about the hereafter. You don't have to worry about salvation. But at last, the most intelligent demon of them all stood up. And he said, well, you know what we need to do? We need to tell everybody, yes, there is a God. Yes, there is Jesus Christ. And yes, believing in him saves. And they all looked at him funny, but he says, but all you have to do is profess faith in Christ and then go on living the same way you did before after you make that profession. And they applauded him. And that's the idea that they, they came up with. And it's still in use today. The devil will tell you that God is real. He'll tell you that Jesus saves and he says, yes, give a little mouth service. And then you go out and live like you did before. You're okay now. You said the words. And people are convinced by that. You see, Paul and James are in perfect harmony about their teaching. There has to be a change in your life. When Paul speaks of works, he's speaking about the works of the law. As I said, like in Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So Paul is talking I said, about to Judaizers, those who are trying to bring that into the church. But he's, you know, he's telling us the law is a mirror. 
It reveals who you are. And you're a sinner. And it can't save you. The works of the law can't save you at all. In one way, shape, or form. James also says you have to do something more than just the works of the law. In verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, it's guilty of all. You have to go back a little bit. That was last week. We need to take a look in the mirror of the Word of God and determine whether or not we're truly saved or just professing and pretending. You know, we start pretending we're little bitty fellows. You know, playing. You know, when I grew up, you were always playing cowboys or something, and you pretended. You grow up, you know, you have to put away childish things and quit pretending anymore. You know, man can't be saved by perfect obedience because he can't render it. And he can't be saved by imperfect obedience because God won't accept it. Well, that leaves us between a rock and a hard place, doesn't it? The only solution to the problem is the perfect redemption that's found in Jesus Christ alone. And James and Paul are both emphasizing that fact. Paul made it clear that men are not saved by the law, but later in Galatians he said, let us not be weary in well-doing. You need to keep working. Once you're saved, there's work to be done. I know that's a, that's a four-letter word today, work. Well, I'll tell you what. People don't want to work. Then I've been watching some old British movies, like movies from the 1800s, 1700s. And the one thing that time after time, these wealthy men, even though they lose their fortune, they don't want to go to work. They want to be gentlemen. Even then, work was a dirty word. But you know, Christians need to work. We have a job to do. And there's a lot of doing that goes along with believing. Paul says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We have a job to do. You don't have to be a, a preacher, an evangelist, a pastor, Sunday school teacher, to work for the Lord. So here Jim, James speaks of works when he says that. He's speaking of the works of faith. Right? In Galatians 5, 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, or not, not sir, uh, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. How often do these two continue to talk about working out of faith? They both taught that faith must be a working faith. A working faith doesn't pull the covers up back over their head on Sunday morning and gets up and goes to church. A working faith doesn't pretend anything. It doesn't go out of the world and act like the world. The believing faith goes out there and talks about Jesus Christ and lives that way. You put on the clothes of a Christian and you get out there in the world and live that way. You know, Calvin put it this way. Faith alone saves but the faith that saves is not alone. And that's true. Saving faith is alive. Professing faith is dead. We have a lot of so-called professing Christians today who are members of churches. That's a fact. But you know what? They're nothing more than zombies. They're walking around and they're talking as if they're alive, but they are dead. You know, one time we were all dead. Spiritually dead. And if you don't have Jesus Christ, you're still spiritually dead. A lot of times I see Christians, they're actually born again Christians, but I'll tell you what, they may not, they're not spiritually dead, but they look like they're in a spiritual coma. Need to poke them a little bit, get them gone. A little boy asked his Sunday school teacher one time, how can I be a Christian and still get my own way? Good question. Sunday school teacher was a very smart cookie. He turned to Romans 8, 5, and he said, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. If you're a child of God, you can't have your own way. You're going to have to have Jesus' way. You have to do it that way. You know, we want to do things our way always, don't we? We want to be in control. It's like driving down the road. You come down 460 doing the speed limit, and somebody wants to pass you because they want to be in front of you. 
They can't be behind. They want to be ahead. They want to do it their way. Because the carnal mind is empty against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. But if ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you, do it God's way, His will. You know, once you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, which happens, and if you were saved this morning, sitting in that pew, before you came up here to tell me about it, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You'd already been baptized. The baptism is eternal. But you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and once that happens, you can produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And if you don't produce that Spirit, something is wrong. A Christian doesn't do what he pleases. He does what Christ pleases. Boy, if the whole church would do that, wouldn't it? I know that we sin. We still sin. I wish we did, but we do. But if we could just continue to do what Christ pleases Christ, wow, wouldn't that be wonderful? Back during the Depression, about almost 100 years ago now, fell up north, uh, he was very wealthy, he had a lot, a lot of problems. He went to his pastor and said, I love my Savior, I love my family, I love my church, I love my business, but there are times I'd like to just walk out on all of them. His pastor looked at him and asked him, why don't you then? He said, because I'm a Christian. And I have to do what God wants me to do. I can't leave any of them. And God will help you with those problems. Saving faith is what makes a Christian go out and do good works. Saving faith will lead to those good works. There are times we might be overly anxious to get church members and we accept them at the slightest profession. We have to watch about that. And that's the reason so many churches are filled with professing Christians this morning who are really unbelievers, still just as lost as ever, still spiritually dead. So we understand that Paul and James use the words faith and works we understand that they're in agreement what they're talking about. They're talking about a believer works because he's saved. He's doing what pleases Christ and, uh, and working for your salvation is just not there. You can't do it. Even though most religions out those doors today are works-based religions. They want you to do this and that and something else. It's Christ. So we need to know about the identification of faith. Saving faith can be identified. Not spiritual fingerprints, if nothing else. Spiritual DNA, whatever you want to call it. There's a verification of genuine faith in the life of the believer. James gives us a practical illustration there in verses 15 and 16. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you saying to them, Depart in peace. Be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give him that thing. Give him not those things which are needful to the body. What does it profit? You know, religious cliches and Christian verbiage, they aren't evidence of saving faith. It's easy to say, God bless you. It's easy to say, Lord, take care of you. It's a little harder to do something about it, isn't it? You know, your vocation has to match your vocabulary. And your works must accompany your words. Words are cheap. Actions are what counts here. We could be pious and say, Brother, I'll pray for you. I know the Lord's going to provide. Well, how do you know the Lord didn't put you in that situation so you could do the providing? Well, I hope, wish you the best. I'll be praying for you. The Lord said, reach in your pocket and give that fellow five dollars. The Lord said, take that fellow to get him something to eat. Go back in your closet and get some of those clothes you never wear and let him have it. Over the years, I have to admit, I've gotten a little tired of watching different things happen. I've seen wealthy men, pastors, and evangelists on the back, and they said, boy, I'm all for you. You're doing the right thing, giving out the word of God. You just keep on going and never give a dime to the ministry. They just, it's easy to speak that away. Where are your works? Where are your works? Where's your action? Where is the identification of your faith? 
You know, I had a difficult time believing fish and see when I see those things. Oh, I tell you. I'm for you, brother. Are you for him? Are you really and truly in back of that person? If living faith produces something, you can identify it by the way someone lives. The Lord himself said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. In Romans, Paul says, O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. When we love, we give. You love the Lord, you give to the Lord. You have faith. The point is that you cannot say that you're a child of God and live like a lawless individual. You can't live like the world. You can't live in willful and continual sin and say, hallelujah, I'm a Christian. Something's wrong if you do. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that when somebody comes up to you on the street and says, hey, buddy, can you let me have somebody to go buy some wine that you give it to them? I'm not saying that. Use a little common sense. I had a fellow one time came up to me and said, Brother, I'm not going to lie to you. I need some money to get something to drink. I said, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to give it to you. If they need, if they're in need, then we met a fellow years ago. We were in Quebec. And we were walking back from old Quebec to the hotel we were staying. And the fellow comes up and starts speaking French. And Dan I said, I don't understand. So he switched to English and just got here from Montreal and I'm. I'm hungry and I don't have any money. We right in front of the sandwich shop. Dad said, I won't give you any money. I'll take you here to eat. And he went. He wouldn't even take anything to drink. He just wanted something to eat. And we've had people that we in KW parking lot. I'm hungry, so we'll take you in here to eat. Oh, they won't let me go in there. They'll let you go in with me. No, they won't. He didn't want me. See, you have to use a little common sense. Help people when you can. Love one another. I don't think everybody should also believe every individual who professes to be a Christian. We have to watch the evidence. We need to test them to see whether they are or not. It'd be wonderful if you could pull up the shirt and see a mark that says, I'm a Christian, but you don't have it there. It would make my job easier. I don't know who preached it. But we have to you know, see those identification marks. You know, I get so thrilled when I see people who adopt a missionary or, or give support to this or do this work and never say a word. Why? Because they're doing it as a Christian and love for Jesus Christ. I'm telling you what, that is the clothing of Christianity. They're really demonstrating their faith. You know, the way they live, what they're doing, in their life, it tells you if their faith is genuine or not. But James says, even so, faith, if it hath, hath not works, is dead being alone. The faith is dead? How a terrible thing to say. Isn't it? Why is it dead? Because living faith, saving faith, produces works. That professing faith, it's dead. It's not producing one thing. And that's the conclusion you draw here from James' illustration. James talks about the fruit of the faith. You know, Paul talks about the root of faith. Those are the separate emphasis of each man. You know, both Paul and James say that faith alone saves. Paul also says that faith is going to produce fruit. Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. And it's going to produce something. It's not going to stand still. The Lord Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. It's going to produce something. There was a pastor who spoke to a fellow who professed to be a Christian. And he asked him, he said, have you united with a church? A Bible-believing church? No, I haven't. That dying thief on the cross, he never united with a church. He went to heaven. Pastor said, have you ever taken the Lord's table? Nope, that dying thief on the cross, he never took the Lord's table. He was accepted. Have you ever been baptized? Well, 
That dying thief was never baptized. He went to heaven. Well, sir, have you ever given to missions? No, that dying thief on the cross, he never gave to missions and he wouldn't judge for it. Pastor got a little disgusted look on his face and kind of, you know, you can always tell when Pastor starts rubbing his chin, he's had about enough. So, well, my friend, he said, the difference between the two of you seems that he was a dying thief and you're a living thief. You see the point? He had no works to show anything. He's just professing faith. And it's sad, you know. There's an old song for a thousand tongues to sing my Redeemer's praise and we don't even use the one that we have. And we sing, for the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small. And then we give him absolutely nothing. I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about anything. We don't give him anything. Our heart, our life, our works. James says that faith, the faith that saves, that saving faith produces something. Lip service is not evidence of saving faith. Even the demons believe and tremble. You ever wonder why the demons tremble? I can tell you exactly why. Jesus didn't die for them. They know where their eternal state is going to be. They tremble because they know judgment's coming and there's nothing they can do about it. If I were an unbeliever, I would tremble. But see, the difference is they believe there's God. The world outside that door, they have their own little gods. And they're not trembling before those little gods because if they don't like them, they just push it out of the way and get them another one. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Sitting on a morgue. You know, it's abundantly clear that faith without the fruit of faith is empty unless and the world can see it. If you're not doing anything, that's what the world's, they don't see you any different than anyone else. What's that Christian doing? He's doing nothing. Now, the illustration of faith that he gives us. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Now, you know, Paul also stated this, that Abraham was justified by faith in Romans. And Genesis tells us that he was justified by faith. How many times in the scripture we say, Abraham believed it was imputed to him for righteousness or reckoned to him for righteousness? Yeah. Was Abraham justified when he offered his son Isaac? There's your question of the day. Was he? Did he actually offer Isaac? Ooh. No, he didn't. He didn't. So, what was Abraham's work of faith? How did works save him? He didn't. Abraham's faith caused him to lift that knife. That's his faith caused him to do what he thought God would never ask him to do. He was ready to plunge that knife. But and he also believed that if he did this, God was going to raise Isaac back. Remember what he told his servant? We're going to go up and worship and we will return. He believed that. And he, actually, Abraham never offered Isaac. Because God provided a substitute. But he would have if God had not stopped him. This is a wonderful illustration of faith, isn't it? He is going to, he demonstrated his faith by his action. God says you do it. He packed up, he left the next morning, made that three-day trip. And in those three days, what was he thinking? His son was dead. <clears throat> Interesting, three days. Then he went up to Mount Moriah. But he's coming back with me. Faith. You see, what was Abraham's action? He believed God. He believed. I don't care what dispensation you lived under, faith was a saving point. Now the second illustration is Rahab. Likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? How was Rahab justified by works? She took in the Israelite spies. She hid them from her own people. Then she told them how to escape without being detected. You know, 
She was living in a city where this jeopardized her life. She turned her back on her people, on her own, own way of life. You see, what had been gained from her suddenly became lost. All those things that, that she liked about Jericho, all of a sudden they weren't that important. You know, she didn't say, when those Israelite spies came in, I'm going to stand by the, the sideline when you come in the city, and I'm going to say, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. She didn't do that. She didn't say, Jesus saves, and she he keeps, and he satisfies. She didn't say, hallelujah, praise the Lord, did she? She didn't give them those little pious words. She said to them, I'm going to do something. I'm going to hide you because I believe God has given the people of Israel this land. We've seen what God has done for you for the last 40 years. At least I have. Abraham, Rahab believed God. And she, because she believed God, she became involved. Here again, she was justified before God by her faith. Hebrews 11.31 Faith, by faith the harlot Rahab perished, not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace, she believed. And those works were seen by everyone. Think about it. And, and get the heart of it. She's someone people look down on. Oh, what a sinner she would be. Well, she also ends up in the line of the Messiah. One of the Gentiles in the line. Gentile blood. You know, before her own people and before the Israelites, she was justified by works. I remember when I was a small boy. Before Dad built the house in Salem, he wanted to plant some trees in the yard. I don't know why. We had apple trees and pear trees and you name it, but he, he wanted to plant a couple. And he went out to the nursery and he came back with, for a boy of six with like little twigs. And he planted them, he told him how to plant them, and he went out and he planted them. In the yard, and I remember mom said, They're gonna die. Mom's always encouraging. They're gonna die. Which you know he cared for them, he watered them. Next spring, they actually had a few little leaves on them. Three or four years later, there were some blooms on there, and then there was some fruit. You know what kind of fruit it was? Cherry. Why were there cherries? Because the root of that tree was cherry. You see. You need to understand that faith is the root for us. And the root produces the same kind of fruit that you're rooted in. That tree wasn't going to produce anything but cherries. And if your faith is rooted in Jesus Christ, it's going to produce fruit for Him. You have to have a living faith. And if you're going to have any, any fruit in your life, it has to be living. Examine yourselves. Whether ye be in faith, prove yourself. And he concludes with, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Faith without works is like a dead body laying in the morgue. You know, trespasses, that's what trespasses, dead bodies lie on top of each other. You know, what can a dead body produce? Somebody will say, nothing. Well, yeah, that's almost true, but it will produce one thing. You let it sit there long enough, it's going to stink. It's going to smell. It's going to produce an odor quickly, and it identifies it as being dead. Professing faith produces nothing at all. Professing faith is dead. Professing faith gives off an unpleasant odor that raises up to God, and it is no more useful than a dead physical body. It stinks. That's the only way I can put it. A dead spiritual body, just like a physical body, it smells. You know, professing faith is smelly, just as a dead body. And it's no more useful to one either. That's what Paul's saying. He says it, James says it, and I believe both of them are giving God's word. When you're only professing faith, you're spiritually dead. You know, which is worse, physical death or spiritual death? Spiritual death. It is. That's the worst. You know, as a believer, you die. That's it. You live forever. 
If you're dying, you're spiritually dead, you're going, you'd be separated from her. You know, we need to understand that there's a world out there that's lost. They're one heartbeat, one breath away from eternity separated from the Lord Jesus Christ. And eternity in hell. But there's a cure. You know, people worry today, no cure for this virus running around. We have a cure for being spiritually dead. It's Jesus Christ. He lives. And because He lives, we can live. Today is the day for a professing Christian to move from the head knowledge of Christ to the heart. Make Christ real in your life. When you make Him real in your life, things are going to happen. And they're all going to be for the good. Make Him real. Understand first that you're a sinner and you're in need of salvation. And if you're playing church, you're still lost. A professing Christian is just as lost as he was before. Don't fool yourself into thinking you're saved just because you said a, a few words when you really didn't truly believe it in your heart. Take a good long look in that spiritual mirror, which is the Bible, the Word of God, and it won't return to you void. Take a good look into it. Are you working for the cause of Christ? Or are you doing nothing and continuing to live in sin? If you're here this morning and your works are not for Christ and, and your life is now no different than it was before you professed salvation, you need to ask the Lord right this moment to show me the truth. Don't play games with your eternity. You know, eternity is a long, long time. You think the virus is bad. You think the flu is bad. You think everything. You haven't seen anything. You need to get right with the Lord, and you need to do it right now. You look in your heart, and you ask yourself honestly, am I really, truly saved? I'll pray, and you talk to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, I don't know hearts. But I know there are a number of people around the world from our little community all over who profess to believe and yet really truly don't. And their life isn't changed. Nothing changes with them. They just go day to day still spiritually dead, walking in the wrong direction, feeling secure in the life of the pit. I pray, Father, this morning, if there's one here, don't let their pride get in the way. Maybe they're not sure of their salvation. Push that pride away from them and let them say that I am a sinner and I need Jesus. And let this be that day, Father. I know there are a lot of needs in lives here this morning. Some are hurting. Some have family members who are hurting. We all have family members and friends who are lost. Lord, work in those lives. Whatever the need is from church membership to salvation, I pray that they would step out and come now. That your Holy Spirit is working in every life. And I pray that you would have your way. Thank you, Lord, for being the God that you are, the God of love and the God of salvation. And I ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, this evening at uh, 6.30, we'll be back in.